everybody! Welcome to episode number 565 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry. Brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by yours truly, Amelia Dalton. I've got a military and aerospace interview triple header coming at you this week. My first guest is Jake Bragelman from New Wave DV. Jake and I discuss the advantages of PMC and XMC cards for modern warfare applications and the benefits that New Wave DV solutions bring to these designs. Also this week, Mike Walmsey from TE Connectivity joins me to discuss recent trends in mil arrow video processing and the video protocols needed to support high-resolution imaging. To finish things up, Billy Ray from Airborne and I discuss connectors for rugged applications. What special design requirements are needed for these kind of applications? And what plating materials are best for rugged designs? So without further ado, please welcome Jake from New Wave DV. Hi Jake, thank you so much for joining me. Hi Amelia, thanks for having me here today. Absolutely. Okay, so first, Jake, for my audience who may not know, what is New Wave DV all about? Yeah, it's a great question. We are very focused on high-speed serial interfaces and FPGA processing in military and defense electronics. So as just a brief intro and example, think of anywhere where you're distributing lots of digitized sensor data. So radar, EW, signal intelligence, that type of sensor is generating a lot of data these days, digitized and then networked through processors, storage, other communications devices, displays. That's really where our product fits in the distribution of that data and the processing of that data with FPGA devices. So you guys offer a variety of PMC and XMC cards. Can you give me some details about those? Yeah, we do, and there are various reasons for those. So one thing you'll notice about all those products is they combine the two elements I was just discussing a bit, which is high-speed interfaces, whether those are optical or electrical, you know, everything from 1 gigabit to second all the way up to 100 gigabit per second kind of interfaces and multiples of those per card, and then supporting different standards, things like Ethernet, Fiber Channel, Serial FPDP, A-Rank 18, and a variety of others. They all have that sort of dynamic going along, along with FPGA-based processing power, you know, a, a gate array for our customers deploy signal processing algorithms, security algorithms, maybe filtering or traffic shaping. That is the dynamic that lives within our products. And then the different flavors are, you know, different FPGA sizes, different interface types, different optical choices. That's really the breadth of the product line. Excellent. Now, what kind of applications would these cards be a good fit for? Yeah, there's a couple different ones, and they're, they're granted they're related, but let me give a few examples. One thing that you'll see a lot in the industry right now is a move toward standards-based processors, FPGA cards, you know, CPU cards, GPU cards, and that's great. And we are big supporters. We're members of SOSA, Vita, et cetera. But you also have a lot of legacy systems out there that need you know, interface support for existing radars or targeting systems or a variety of different things. So one thing our XMCs do is allow you to bring that great COTS hardware and use a standard like ours, an XMC standard, but still interface to all these existing systems that are out there. The other thing we do is bring that FPGA, you know, modern high powered FPGAs to the application so you can offload the traffic, offload the network processing, offload kind of that protocol stack. And the advantage for that is you want your CPUs and your GPUs to be focused on running algorithms and applications, not on processing packet data, you know, networking packet. That That's really what our product is focused on is giving that interface to the system, whether it's a legacy or a brand new interface, you know, 100 gigabit ethernet and those types of interfaces. Let our product take care of those interfaces in a standards-based way, and then let the CPUs and GPUs perform the applications. And you guys also offer many different interface IP cores as well, right? And these are for engineers looking for a more 
turnkey solution, correct? Yeah, to some extent, or also, you know, an off-the-shelf solution, right? So we were talking about those legacy interfaces as well as, you know, the current cutting-edge ones, like we were talking about 100 gigabit Ethernet. Those IP cores let us do a couple things. One is we get to build standard form factor hardware in a standard part number across a variety of different interface needs. So for example, serial FPDP, fiber channel, A-Rank 818, those are standards used across our mill aero platforms today and into the future. And we can build one set of hardware and then load that hardware at the appropriate IP cores for the various interfaces and systems out there. So having that IP core plus hardware dynamic allows us to basically scale the hardware across lots of different instances in a standards-based way. So what kind of applications would these interface IP cores be a good fit for? Yeah, so the IP cores are almost always focused on interfacing to sensors, frankly, or the mission system or processors of those sensors, right? Depends which side of the link you're looking at, right? Are you trying to uh, distribute that sensor data through the system or are you trying to kind of subscribe to that sensor data, right? Be the receiver of that sensor data and do something with that data. The IP cores are always situated on one end of the link or both and really have the job of delivering digitized sensor data in a high bandwidth, low latency fashion without burdening the processing elements in the system. That's what they're for. So you guys have two new 3U VPX modules as well, right? Tell me more about those. Yeah, it is a really exciting product launch here at New Wave. As you said in the intro to our discussion. To date, New Wave has been very focused on XMC modules primarily, right? A standard mezzanine brings FPGAs and interfaces, as we discussed. Um, We are taking our expertise in that area and our focus in that area and expanding our product line to 3U VPX modules. The idea there is we're able to bring bigger FPGAs, more I.O., fit into, you know, a standard plug-in card concept, So we're very excited to be taking our current expertise in products, but really expanding into 3U module offerings in the market. So they're all versatile based. They have AI and machine learning capabilities. They have the high bandwidth interfaces we've been talking about, you know, multiple ports of 100 gig Ethernet. And they're all SOSA aligned FIDA standards based products. All right, Jake, it is time for your off-the-cuff question. Now, since you haven't been on my show before, you get our standard off-the-cuff. So if you could have one meal right now, it doesn't matter if it's on the other side of the world, you need a passport to get there, what would you have? Boy, that is a good question. I think, I don't know if it's the mood I'm in or what, but I guess if there's one meal I could have right now, and I am not from Chicago, so I don't even know where this is coming from exactly, but <laughs> if I could just drop into Chicago and get some Chicago deep dish pizza, I think I think that's what I'd go for right now. I love it. That sounds delicious. Well, Jake, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. All right. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Next up, longtime friend of the show, Mike Walmsey from TE Connectivity, and I chat all about video processing and the newest protocols needed to support high-resolution imaging. So without further ado, please welcome Mike to Fish Fry. Hi, Mike. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi, Amelia. Good to be here. So first off, let's talk about industry trends when it comes to video streams. Yeah, so there's been increasing demand like in for situational awareness and there's new challenges. So there's more complex video processing coming from multiple sources. There's the need to fuse data from multiple video data streams and do AI inference. So do the AI within the processing to identify targets and, and determine measures. So there's also a balance between having high fidelity signals and also low latency. So you can compress video, but you know, you start to lose some of the resolution of the video by doing that. So uh, there's been a lot of efforts to try to do video processing that can handle the higher speeds, handle the, the increased bandwidth that's needed. So we're talking about higher and higher speed video these days. So where does the evolution of interconnects fit in here? Well, if we look at how video is captured and processed and put into an output of display, latency becomes a big issue. Obviously, you need very quick turnaround on the output to see what's happening in, in the battlefield. 
So if you look at the optics in the past, it's been a lot of coax solutions that don't hit the frequencies of where some of the higher speed protocols are going today. And optics is playing a larger role in, in that chain as well. So we've got protocols that are doing like 12 gigahertz data rates and like 12 gig SDI. And we go from three, six and 12 gig SDI. CoExpress has protocols that go to CXP12, which is 12 gigahertz. Arink 818 is for avionics, can run over copper or fiber and can go to 28 gigabond at their highest speeds. So a lot of the interconnects through the channel in the past and legacy systems aren't reaching those speeds for the next products that we need. So we've developed 75 of them coax solutions inside the box for a VPX plug-in card going to a backplane and also going outside the box cable to cable. We have true 75 ohm impedance coax, which has excellent signal integrity versus using 50 ohm or uh, non-impedance match solutions of the past. We also have the capability to introduce optics into it using MT connectors. So a lot of the work that's been done in the VPX portfolio today with MTs and uh, fiber counts can be used not only for ethernet, but can be used for Arink 818 to run video signals. So Mike, from an interconnect standpoint, processing units inside the box. Now, where would we find an example of this on the market today? Okay, so there are sensor cards today. And in my talk tomorrow at Embedded Tech Trends, I'll show a Wolf Advanced Technology solution where they've got a SPC, a single board computer. They've got a sensor card that can run video. They've got a switch and they've got a, a GPU that can do the processing. And, you know, within that, you're bringing the captured signals in. You can do the processing from the sensor card that's bringing in the video signals to you can go directly to the GPU for processing. And those sensor card and the GPU both have RF and optics on them. So you could either do it digitally through the VPX connector or you could do it through RF or optics within that system. So there's the multiple options and different protocols that can be run with a kind of a common standard solution. So talk to me about what kind of media can be used in this arena and the benefits of each. There's actually a mix. We're seeing protocols like CoExpress become more common, which uses single coax line and it can actually have power run through it. So it could power a camera or device. And then that will always run through coax. Arink 818 can run through a coax or digital signal digital copper signal or through an optical interface. So it's a little more versatile in that regard. A lot of the composite video protocols like Stanag 3350 and RS-170 are still widely used and they're traditionally coax, they're analog signals. All right, Mike, it is time for your off the cuff question. Now, if you could have one meal right now, it doesn't matter if it's on the other side of the world, you need a passport to get there, what would you have? I would have Kung Pao beef from Chengdu. Nice. I was in Western China once and it was the most amazing Kung Pao beef I've ever had. It's where it's from, the region it's from, and uh, it was like nothing else. So I would love to have that without having to travel back to go get it. Excellent. Well, Mike, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks, Amelia. And one last interview for this week. My last guest is Billy Ray from Airborne. And we're talking about the definition of ruggedization, the special design requirements needed for rugged applications, and more. So please welcome Billy to Fish Fry. Hi, Billy. Thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having us. So first off, for my audience who may not know, what is Airborne all about? Yeah, so we're a uh, connector and cabling manufacturing company. We service the military, aerospace, commercial air, and space market. Okay, so let's talk about ruggedization. So, Billy, what exactly does it mean to be rugged? I have heard several different definitions over the years, and it seems to be a bit subjective sometimes. It's very subjective. As connector manufacturers, we always think our product is the best, right? Every manufacturer has their own opinion on what's rugged, but, you know, everyone's been in business 65 plus years, and, and we've serviced those markets where, you know, our CEO, to quote her, our, our products can't fail. So having that multi-points of contact, 50 micro inches of gold, all the different tolerances and alignment features that we put into our products, that really develops into a rugged interconnect. 
So what does it take to make a connector rugged? What kind of contact materials are best for these kinds of connectors? Most manufacturers, the best one is beryllium copper. It really holds its shape. When you go to mate it and unmate it, it doesn't lose its form. It keeps that normal force on the contact. So you, you know, make sure you've got a good electrical path in that interconnect. So what about plating materials? What kind of plating materials are best here? A lot of our competitors use, you know, 15 to 30 micro inches. We're more on the 50 micro inch side. Uh, that's kind of across the board for all of our products. And then under that, we use a nickel underplate, which is usually 150 to 300 micro inches. And what that does is it provides a barrier so you don't have copper migration coming through the gold. So you keep that clean path on top of that gold. So what kind of needs or requirements are you seeing in the field these days? You know, we talk a lot about swap C. You know, things got to be smaller, lighter, but at the same time, you can't really lose that performance, especially the performance that we're known for with that four points of contact and that rugged interface. So, you know, we talk about swap C. That's the biggest requirement we're seeing today. Okay, cool. So what in particular is Airborne doing to address these needs? Yeah, we just launched a new product called Synergy. So it's a smaller, lighter, more hybrid type product. It still keeps that four points of contact, metal shell, all the alignment features we talked about today. But it's also doing it, it's one of our highest performing products we've gone to market with. It's set up to where it's not just a standard mill grade product, but it's made so that it's got a 100 ohm impedance type contact. It has high performance, it's automated. You know, everything that we've kind of found where we was like, man, I wish we would have fixed that one little thing with this connector. It'd have been great. We tried to implement those things in a synergy. Okay, cool. Well, Billy, it is time for your off the cuff question. So if you could have one meal right now, it doesn't matter if it's on the other side of the world or you need a passport to get there, what would you have? Cold beer right now. After today, uh, Setting up on stage, I think after after today is over, set back, have a cold beer, and uh, appreciate that today's done, and we've met a lot of new people, and I think that's what I'd go with today. All right. I love a good beer myself, so follow-up question here, Billy. What kind of beer would you have? Oh, man, I think we're out in Arizona, probably some kind of Spanish lager, Mexican lager, something like that. A Dos Equis sounds pretty good right now with a little salt and lime on it. Yes, it does. Well, Billy, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If you're into X, you can monitor our tweets at EE Journal TFM. And don't forget, if you would like to follow my personal account, check out Amelia D. 1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, I dig it. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we are also on Blue Sky Social and Mastodon as well. Also, we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash eejournal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by yours truly. And, of course, you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe to this here podcast on Spotify, Google Podcasts, Podbean, Apple Podcasts, or just about any other podcasting platform to listen to some super exciting upcoming episodes. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com, or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of January 12th, 2024, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried.